For the people that don't know Stephen Kluski, he's a successful entrepreneur, and he's an advocate, and he's a public speaker, and he's an all-round uh, great guy. Uh, Stephen, would you mind giving the, the guys here a little bit of an overview about uh, your injury and how that uh, came about? Okay, we'll start with the depression stuff. So. Um, so look, it was the 4th of August, 2002. Um, the weather was beautiful. The Dubs had just drawn in the Art Island quarter-final with Donegal and life couldn't have been better. I got in from the match and I got a phone call from a friend to see if I wanted to go camping that night. And I thought with the day that was in it, weather the way it was, why not? So we arrived to this field in North County Dublin, a field that I should have known well, I knew well growing up in the area. Set the tents up and settled down. Um, now I still don't know why I did it to this day, Maybe it was because I was an 18 year old and that's what 18 year olds do, but not far from where the tents were, there was a, a round hay bale. It's only about five, five and a half foot tall altogether. And I decided to jump on top of it. And as I was on it, all of a sudden, I felt to begin to move, to roll. I looked back and saw that one of the friends was pushing it. And I tried to keep my balance, but a couple of seconds later I fell. And next came this, it's like an Indiana Jones type moment, you ever see the, the boulder where I was trying to escape from it? Well, this wasn't a movie and I wasn't as fortunate as Indy. As I went to <coughs> get out of the way, I lifted my head and the rolling bale caught the back of my head and pushed it forward and I heard a crack. And in an instant, everything in my body just went dead. So I I heard a bit of commotion. I asked one of my friends to lift my arm and I saw this hand appear in front of my face, a hand that I, I should have recognized as my own, but I didn't. And when he let go, my arm dropped to the ground with a thud and I knew something serious had happened. So next I was taken to the Matter Hospital and after what seemed like an endless amount of scans and x-rays and MRIs, the doctor came in to tell me the news and I'd broken my neck. So from there I was transferred to the rehab hospital in Dunleary to uh, face the rehab and the goals were set week to week and I saw this body deteriorating in front of my eyes nearly on a daily basis and after more than a year then into my sentence I was released back out into the world to try and build some sort of a normal life again. That was at 19. What's going through your head when this is happening and over the coming weeks and the doctor says that to you, what, 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 do, you, what do you do, what do you respond? It's a hazy time. It's hard to remember exactly, but to be honest, I was very positive from the outset. Um, I didn't then and I still don't see this as a permanent situation. Um, but I did find some coping mechanisms. And I knew the paralysis was obviously going to be a major battle, but you know the whole mental side to that was also going to be massive. And the last thing I wanted to do was go insane or crazy. So I made a decision to keep my mind as distracted as possible. Like I said I was 18 at the time, so I was going into sixth year in Belvedere College and I decided to do my leave insert while just injured and just in the <coughs> hospital. And you know, that seemed to really help. After completing the leave insert, I got a real sense of achievement. And I liked that feeling and then I thought, well, after that, why not go to college? And then after that, I thought, well, why not start a business? And after that, why not try and help? people in a similar situation. And so from that initial position of pure vulnerability and pure helplessness, I began to see opportunities and possibilities just by saying, why not? One of the most striking things, the more I research and get to know you, is how passionate you are to help other people. And by going down to Leinster House and getting involved in that, what, what drives you to want to help other people? Because a lot of people might look inwards and be, be a bit of a victim. So what makes you want to always try to help other people and make a difference? 
it's it's selfish actually because you get an enormous amount of satisfaction from that. There's a great quote says we make a we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give, and I think there's a hell of a lot of truth in that. Um, and like Phoebe from Friends says, that there's no such thing as a, a selfless good act. <laughs> you get something from it. You feel good from doing it. You know. So th- I get a lot from it. It's not. It's not. It, it helps me. I think more than anyone else. Tell me a little bit about uh, challenge access and uh, then mobility mojo. Yeah, so that was a campaign we had in April, which we were lucky enough to, to launch on the Late Late Show. Um, but I think my, my journey really, the first, so I was injured in 2002, first eight, eight to 10 years was just dedicated to trying to recover, bring about as much recovery as possible. I traveled the world, I was in Portugal, I was in the States, top physios, therapists, all of that. But I had an incident in 2010 in Dublin here at a friend's birthday party and as a wheelchair user, to get a wheelchair accessible taxi, you need to give 24 hours notice and even at that you're not really guaranteed that you're going to actually get it. So I came out from friend's birthday party off Grafton Street, had pre-booked the taxi, no sign of it. Long story short, spent the next five hours at the side of the road in the pouring rain with a friend or two trying to hail down an accessible taxi. Bit the bullet, I'm quite stubborn. 6 a.m. I had to phone the parents who get out of bed to come in to provide a service which should already be in place. But to be honest, that was one of the best experiences of my life because it set me on this incredible advocacy journey. I knew what had to be done to change regulations, to bring about improvements there. I lobbied the government that got me on this whole path of this advocacy. So from that, I got appointed to the Taxi Advisory Committee to advise the government, which was there this morning, on the taxi industry by our current Taoiseach, Bradker. Um, I then secured more than three million euros to put more wheelchair taxis on Irish roads. I helped bring about a number of different regulation changes. From that, I developed a TV show which went on to receive an IFTA nomination um, and then the Challenge Access campaign. So it's just one after another and pushing those limits and just taking a chance and you know stepping beyond that comfort zone has been so rewarding and beneficial. Totally it's inspiring, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go, I didn't under promise that. Totally over delivered, it's a super yeah. job. Uh, I think that's just a kind of remarkable. <laughs> got some interesting stories uh, with a certain um, rock band. Do you want to share that maybe? Yeah, well I was giving a talk a couple of weeks back to a school down the road here, a group of six year students, and I was asked one of the best questions that I was ever asked, which I was hoping you'd ask me. I could, I could, I could ask it too. I'll, 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 so what's, what's the best thing that's happened since the accident? Yeah, and it's a nice positive question because it's always, the questions are always, oh, it's terrible, this, that. So one of the six year students said, since your injury, what's the best thing that's happened to you? And there's one incident which stands out. Now I was still in the hospital, I was only a couple of months into the injury, and um, I was in a 12 bed ward with 11 other guys. It's about halfway down the ward in St. Joseph's in the NRH. And every, so my mom has a couple of sisters, my dad has a couple of sisters, food in the hospital wasn't great, so they, devise a rota where one of them would do a dinner for me each day and bring it in. I was blessed, privileged. So it was Vera's day. Vera wouldn't be the very greatest cook. So <laughs> <laughs> but she came in and she had my two cousins with her as well. And I could sense there was something strange going on. There was an air that was unusual, but I didn't really cop onto it. So Vera was giving me this bit of chicken and I had a bit of chicken in my mouth. I was chewing away. And I looked down the end of the ward, and this guy walked in with red sunglasses on. And I went back to chewing the chicken, and then I looked again, and I'm oh my God, that's Bono. <laughs> so next it turned into this sort of spaghetti western type thing, where the other guys in every bed, you know, you don't think it's celebrities coming in, but we all were sort of looking at each other like that, thinking, <laughs> who's he here to see? 
And he walked down and he stopped in front of me. And he said, oh, hey, Stephen, how are you? And just as he said that, I half swallowed a bit of chicken. <laughs> and started to choke a bit. <laughs> so I was coughing and trying to get it up. And eventually I got my composure. Now, the next 10 or 15 minutes, no idea what we talked about. No recollection at all. Just a haze. Massive U2 fan. So this was just a dream come true. Bono coming to visit me in the hospital. So I was in a, a power chair at the time and using my chin to drive it and control it. And when we went to move off, when I move off now, I get a bit of spasm, so my legs might jump a little bit. So we went, went to move off and my legs jumped. And he stopped and he looked down and he said, oh my God, did you move your legs? And I think in his head he was thinking, Bono's after performing a bit of a <laughs> So I said, no, look, it's just awesome. don't worry about it, it's nothing. Uh, we went outside and he said, to me, we're recording a new album, do you want to come into the studio, meet the rest of the guys, you're more than welcome. Usually you'd be polite and say, oh, no, 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 it's like, yeah, crash. <laughs> okay. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I got a phone call from the secretary to say, the recording in a couple of days, if you want to come in, bring a friend or two. So we got to go in, spent the whole day, we, you two listening to all the new music and had one of the best days ever. It's brilliant. <laughs> so, have you had uh, many mentors or people that have offered you a good piece of advice that meant a lot to you? I've been so fortunate. We started a business from, from that incident of the taxi in, incident on, uh, on Grafton Street. I started a company called Wheelchair Taxi Dolly, which was to help people all over the country find accessible transport, which led on to Go Accessible, which then led to Mobility Mojo, which is the, the current business. Um, I met my business partner at a Social Entrepreneurs of Ireland event about two years back. I was tackling the transport side of things, which is my passion. She was tackling the accommodation side of things. So we joined forces. And again, that's been the most amazing journey. So we got investment from Enterprise Ireland. We got accepted onto a program with the National Digital Research Center. Uh, we went on then to win the Social Entrepreneurs of Ireland Award the following year, um, an Irish Responsible Tourism Award, and a number of other things. But from that, we're based in the NDRC, which is beside the Guinness Enterprise Center, Guinness Storehouse, and we're surrounded by some incredible mentors. But reaching out, like James reached out to you, I often reach out to people for some advice on that. Great guy I met uh, a number of years ago who gave me the best bit of advice I think I've had, which is very relevant to the situation. He said that um, we're all faced with a series of great opportunities which are wrapped up initially, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. And I, I wouldn't have done any of what I have done if it wasn't for this injury and that accident. So I think that, for me, is the one that really jumps out. And if you were offering advice to your younger self, is there anything in particular that you would probably give a little bit more specifically at all? Or? I thought about that a lot as well, since you asked it. <coughs> you know, 18 is a bit of a dodgy time for me, yeah. with everything that happened. So I know, I, you know, the advice on not going out that night was the obvious one. But to be honest, I was, um, I thought things came easy at that age and I thought, you know, everything was easy and that you just sort of go with the flow. But what I've learned is to, to make an impact or to achieve anything, these things take a long time. And perseverance is the word that jumps out, to really persevere. You know, I played a lot of tennis growing up, I played a lot of rugby, well, I played a year of rugby in school. And I loved it, but for whatever reason, I didn't <coughs> pursue it. And those sorts of things, I wish I had, they the one or two regrets that I wish I had continued with, because again, who knows what, what sort of opportunities would have come from it. Tell me about um, the future. What, what are you looking to achieve and what would uh, make a big difference to your life and to other people that you're looking to do advocacy work for? Well, firstly, I want to Try and build an amazing business which is going to impact on people globally. What we do, it's like a trip advisor, but with a focus on accessibility and it's a 
a need which is global. You know, Ireland isn't unique in the fact that we've we haven't great accessibility or any information around that. Um, but I think in time down down the road, I mean, I've been incredibly fortunate. I have amazing friends, amazing family, and amazing support since this happened. Not everyone in my situation is that fortunate. There's more than 600,000 people in Ireland with a declared disability. And I think I'd like to help them in some way over time, possibly getting involved in the in politics at some level here in Ireland. I've, I've seen that from talking to the decision makers and the influencers, that's where you can make the impact. And I'd be so privileged and honored to be the first quadriplegic in Leinster House as well. I think everybody here would support that. Yeah. 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 Just want to say thank you very much Thanks, for today. That was uh, inspirational. This is why I do what I do. Uh, I just learned so much from us, and uh, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much.